happy Sabbath, good morning, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. We are so excited for this Sabbath because we are starting the new quarter um, and especially in terms of Bible study through our lesson. It's been quite an exciting year. Eh? Like, I mean, in terms of uh, Sabbath school lesson discussions, um, the writers have just been so awesome. We started with Psalms. From Psalms, we moved to Revelation, where we started the Great Controversy. Then we moved to Mark, which we just finished last Sabbath. And today, we are starting with another exciting gospel, which is the Gospel of John. And the title of our fourth quarter is Things in the Gospel of John. We are going to meet quite a strategic writer. There are writers who just write from left to right, but John is a bit different. He's very strategic. He's keen to details. He's not just writing to tell your story. At the end of the story, he wants you to learn something. And what John wants you to learn and understand as a believer, as a Christian, as someone who is on his way or on her way to heaven, the power of God, the glory that comes with Jesus. And he's pointing us straight to his master, who is Jesus. So I'm joined by my wonderful team who will be with us through this quarter, hopefully. <laughs> and in a short while, they'll be telling us their names and also what title of the lesson for this week they'll be taking us through. Before then, I ask that my sister here opens for us with a word of prayer. Let's be believe and pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we come before your presence this moment. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and thank you for the blessedness of your word. Even as we delve into the study of your word and even of the lesson, we pray that utterance may be granted unto each and every one of us, that your spirit may as well abide with us to uh, seal into memory all the precious truths that, sh that we shall glean from the study of thy word this moment. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, thank you. So from my right, uh, please tell us your name and what you'll be taking us through. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. My name is Brian Ayako. I'll be taking us through the day Tuesday, titled The Miracle at the Pool of Bethesda. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, my name is Ted Langat, and I'll be taking us through the title Hard Hearts. Hard Hearts. <laughs> okay. Yes. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, my name is Marion, and I'll be taking us through the second sign in Galilee. Amen. Amen. Mm, happy Sabbath. Uh, happy. My name is Onsongo, Rafael Nyamisoa, and uh, be looking, uh, we'll be looking together with you at the wedding at Kana. The wedding at Kana. Wow. So our key text is coming. Oh, I'm Rumona Pio, and I'm so happy to be part of this panel. The um, title for this week is Signs That Point the Way. So what are these signs? Who is the way or what is the way? Who are they pointing or who is pointing this way? Signs that point the way. Our memory text comes from the book of John chapter 20, verse 30, all the way to 31. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Such a powerful way to start our quarter. And I'm looking at where John, or rather where his test is, is coming from. This statement, his statement for writing, or rather answering the question of why was the book of John written. Many a times, if you are a reader, you'll read a book, or the first question you'll ask yourself was, is why was this book written? Or why did the author take all this struggle to sit down and do what and write? Writing is not easy. It takes sweat. It takes time, sometimes even sleepless nights, you know? But the question as to why, if it's not answered, sometimes it leaves you with a lot of confusion. But John is very careful not to leave us with a, 
with confusion. And that is why he starts us off by telling us, or rather, the statement comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, to tell us that, you know what? I have written so much. I've written about the signs. You know, I've written, and he knows he's cognizant of the fact that there's other gospels that have been written. But he's telling you that Jesus did many other signs. And my one of the favorite theologians that I love reading, William Barclay, says that John is not an exhaustive account of everything that Jesus said or what he did, but a selection which shows what Jesus was like and what kind of things he liked to do and why he was always doing them. He continues to say that the Gospels were meant to not to be biography, historical information that it is telling us, you know, Jesus was born in Nazareth. You know, on this day, Jesus did this and that. Jesus met this and that. Uh, or he had an issue with Pharisees. No, that is not the main aim of the gospel. Jesus is appealing to the gospel. We are to take him as our savior, you know. We are to take him as someone who loves to serve the Lord. Because in the book of, when you read the book of John chapter 8, verse 29 to 32, it says that Jesus loved to please his father. He loved to do things that glorify his father. And so the aim for us, even as we read the book of John, is to not just get information, but to get the main picture of Jesus as a healer, as a friend, and to see Jesus as the son of God who lived among the people. In this belief, we are going to be able to see Christ as who he is, as our savior and as our redeemer. And that takes us to the first miracle that Jesus performed. And it is the wedding at Cana. On Songo, please take us through that. So the wedding at Cana is a significant uh, miracle that has uh, indeed uh, uh, drawn controversy uh, many a times because of some of the themes uh, mm -hmm. that uh, surround this particular wedding. There's one particular miracle that many, both in the church and outside the church, celebrate, and that is the miracle of changing water into wine. Mm. And the controversy usually is around uh, what, what exactly was the type of wine that Christ made mm. for them. Mm -hmm. Was it alcoholic? Was it non-alcoholic? Mm. But we know uh, through scripture and uh, through the consistency of scripture that indeed wine is a mocha and strong drink is raging. Mm. And we have various authors such as Ellen White uh, and other commentaries that actually uh, seem to tell us that this wine that was made was actually uh, the fruit of the fruit of the grape. It wasn't alcoholic. Mm. And one thing also that helps us to sort of identify that this wine was different is that even when the head of the, the chief guest, the head of the party, tests this wine, he realizes that it's actually quite different. Mm. Right? It, quite, it, it actually is quite different and, and, it, and it is rich. But nonetheless, uh, the wedding at Cana is one of Christ's uh, first miracles. Mm. Imagine if you are a politician or you are somebody great and you want to launch your career, um, how would you want to do it? Do you want to do it at some, do you want to throw your own party mm. or do you want to go at somebody else's party? Mm. Scarcely would somebody want to um, announce themselves uh, at, at somebody else's party. But Christ chooses to go to a community event and uh, it's significant also that he chose a wedding in that we see um, one of the institutions uh, that were established in Eden was the Sabbath mm. and, and, and marriage. Amen. And so Christ mm. chooses to begin his, uh, his ministry, his public ministry uh, at a wedding in Cana. It's actually quite significant in also telling us the, the, the blessing and, 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 uh, and the way God uh, appro approaches and, and, and reveres marriage to the extent that he comes to the rescue mm. of a wedding party. Mm. And it tells us that Christ was a man of the community uh, in that him being present, um, we're told his mother was there. And so I think the mother was friends. Uh, it, is, it is alluded they were friends with whoever was having the, the wedding in terms of the relatives and their family friends. And, um, and Christ 
uh, comes, uh, is invited and he comes along with his 12 disciples. Other people say perhaps they could be part of the reason why the wine ra ran out because he came with an invited guest, uh, you know, and you're invited alone and then you come with 12 men, fishermen, or with the thirst of fishermen, you know, and, and their hunger. Uh, but uh, such was Christ. Christ is a community person. And um, when he sees that they, 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 they is a, there's a problem, he, he tells them to these, these jars which had water, six water pots. In the book of John chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing um, two or to three, some, trans some translations uh, call, the, call them what? Fakins. In a, in, in a different uh, rendering of the text, uh, actually speaks to them as gallons, if I am not wrong. Um, this is from... Um, from uh, Yes, yeah, gallons, 20 to 30 gallons um, from the NSAB. So um, he fills them and then he tells the gentleman to go give it to the governor of the feast. You know, it's, an, it's, it's interesting even the way this miracle is performed in that he spoke. He didn't, he didn't mix, he didn't fetch the water, he simply gave instructions and tells tell people, fill this and give this to, the, to them. And when the, the governor of the party sips uh sips this i don't know what type of uh, portfolio you need to be a governor of a party that you you always test uh, the first things eh? uh, must have been a prestigious job but he sips and, and he says and he calls the groom and tells him never in his life has he ever tested wine as good as this never in his life has he ever had an experience such as this in which for where whereas most of the people tend to put their best foot forward it seems as if this groom had decided to bring that which was best last. You know, almost echoing also the gospel story that that which we thought was good and had, and, 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 and had passed away through Christ, we can have a revival. Through Christ, we can have um, better things even to come. When we think that the party is over, when we think that we are, our energies and our best efforts, our best years are in our past, through Christ, the gospel story tells us that indeed, um, where we are going, in fact, it will be even better than Eden, you know. And and so and so, uh, in essence, this 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 miracle has got rich lessons. And uh, perhaps we could spend the whole the whole one hour dissecting it. But beyond that, we look at our, we we ask ourselves, what is the reason that Christ did these miracles? Why did the, what is the reason that Christ did these miracles? Christ is compared to Moses, and Moses himself is on record in multiple places, giving the disciples this uh, and, 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 and Christendom uh, after him uh, and believers after him in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15 and says that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among, from among you, from among the countrymen and you shall listen to him. And what, was the, what, are, the, uh, what are the comparisons between Moses and Christ? We see in Moses a savior who is literally saving them physically. He moves them from Egypt into the promised land. And in Christ, we see now one who comes to a people who are in the promised land, but his, his kingdom, um, uh, which, was, uh, which was also his goal to, for his disciples to understand, is now he wants to move us spiritually or mentally from uh, Egypt into the promised land. Because it is possible uh, spiritually to be actually in church, but in, in terms of our convictions, that we are not in the right place. We can be Adventists. We can be uh, like the Jews were in, 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 in temples and in all these uh, synagogues and in all these places. We could be in the right place, but our minds are not there. And so we see Christ, like Moses, shifting, uh, trying to pull the minds of the people beyond the Jewish traditions, beyond the, t the teachings of the Father, and really acquainting them of their fathers to, to really acquainting them with God the Father. And, uh, and, and so this miracle was performed, one, to help those who were in the party, the groom, and, and, and the community because they were in need. So Christ, God is one who is acquainted with our needs, physical needs. He's not, he's not oblivious that uh, he only seeks our spiritual nourishment, but even our, our physical nourishment. And, and that's important, and that's significant for me, and I hope it is also for you. But beyond that also, he gives them this miracle as the first thing that he does to grant them confidence in him. That if he can do this with water, simply by speaking, as, you, as, as uh, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 it says, uh, darkness moved upon the face of the deep, and then God spake. You know, he spake where there was water, and, 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 and eventually 
he brought everything into being that he was in essence he was telling them that he who has creative power is amongst you i am god without telling them uh trying to win uh, their confidence before that time comes uh when their faith will be shaken and when they are, when perhaps they'll be tempted to to distrust and so that is the wedding at Cana much more we could say but uh time limits us and we need to keep uh, keep going yes I have loved that you have not left us without hope. You've told us that, you know what, when you are thinking that your best days are far much spent, um, verse 10 of John chapter 2, it says, And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then he, the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. When you're feeling like your ears are inferior, just go to the master and tell him, you know what? Jesus, you turned water into wine. You can surely make my life better. What st st stands out for me in the chapter of John chapter 2, where this mi uh, miracle happens, verse 3, it says, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. It is actually the mother of Jesus who initiated this miracle. Verse 4, it says, And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Mahawa has not what yet come. His mother said to the servant, Whatever he says to you, do it. Sometimes we are at the verge of receiving our miracles, and then just one response like this one, like Jesus is telling, you know what, my time has not yet come. You give up. What if Mary just went and stayed in her corner and started having a pity party for herself? We will never have a record of this miracle. So please don't give up. Christ is still in the business of making your life better. We move to the second miracle, or rather... Mm, from the wedding of Cana, we move to the second sign in Galilee. Marion. Um, on to the second miracle. Mm -hmm. We've exhaustively discussed the first miracle. Mm -hmm. And just to set a preamble is that um, I have taken a liking to try and always look into the right of a book before mm -hmm. uh, partaking in the, or indulging in the works. Mm -hmm. And something of special note and about John mm -hmm. is that he was a man I would typically say in, in this present mm -hmm. day and age uh, was a man who was very in touch with his emotions. Mm. He was a man <laughs> who was emotionally aware and I say that because you know there's um, evidence that it was said that he will actually he was first he was the most beloved disciple he was very um, he couldn't hide it, mm. that he loved his master. Mm. He truly loved his master. Mm. And it is even said that he would even lay his head upon the bosom of the master mm. and of the savior. And so you go on even to read his writings and the numerous themes that he talks about, talking about truth, love, light, belief. Mm. And it's even said of the gospels, beginning from Matthew. Matthew was written to the... Um, to the Jewish, to a Jewish audience. And Luke was written to, uh, no, it's Mark. Mark was written to a Roman audience. Mm. Luke was written to a Greek audience. But when it comes to John, it is said that it was written for everybody. And so going into this lesson, there's a lot we can learn. Mm. And one thing I, I like about the literary expression of John is that he says it as it is, mm -hmm. and in a sense, he brings it in a very simple way such that uh, the very least can actually understand mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. As scripture says, he makes wise the simple. Um, and so going on to the second miracle, just quickly, I, I would prefer that we read the passage of scripture because it holds uh, such beauty in its wording. Um, so reading from the King James Version, that is John chapter 4, from verse 46 to 54, I'll just read in our hearing. Uh, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, 
Come down ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Mm -hmm. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. I mean, I was thinking when I was reading this passage of scripture, it would have easily ended there and we would have picked the, the lesson from it. Mm -hmm. But it continues to even give further evidence when it says, And he was now going down, his servants met him, and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, mm. the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself, be and himself believeth, and his whole uh, house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. I really like how uh, how John brings it out, and there are many lessons we can glean. I mean, one I would first begin by saying, um, what is the need for a second miracle? Mm. And I would say, I think it was building up to the evidence that was already there. John was essentially trying to tell the people that uh, these miracles are just making revelatory of who Jesus is, mm. and it was to make known to them who who, who Christ was. And one of the beautiful lessons I would I would want to just bring to our, our attention is one, mm -hmm. uh, like the afflicted father, we are often led to seek Jesus by the desire for some earthly good, mm -hmm. and upon the granting of our request, we rest our confidence in His love. But the Lord desires us to renounce the selfishness and the evil of our own mm -hmm. hearts, and realize our deep need of His grace. Why do we say that? Um, when you read Hebrews eleven six, he talks about, um, and they that come to him must believe that he mm. is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek mm. him. And so, in a sense, Paul is trying to bring us to an understanding that we don't go to God uh, because he is able to do stuff for us. Essentially, he is able to do stuff for us, um, we're not to go to him with ulterior motives, if I can say that, yeah, okay. or with uh, a desire to just uh, be a receiver of the gifts rather than uh, of the giver of the gift. Another lesson would be that the nobleman wanted to see the fulfillment of his prayer before uh, he should believe, but he had to accept the word of Jesus, that his request was heard and the blessing was granted. Amen. And so it is in us in prayer. When we come to God in prayer, we are to believe that he is, as we have read mm -hmm. in, in, in Hebrews 11 verse 6, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Um, just to also bring out the element of the miracles is, we know it was... Um, with them was a heart issue. Mm. And why do I say that? Because when you read actually in John 12, 37, it says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Mm. So it was not a question of the miracles. It was the stitch of their heart. And the post, uh, and uh, yeah, essentially the stitch of their heart. Um, they had uh, held within them uh, doubt and disbelief. Mm. And so maybe you are one who struggles with doubt or one who struggles with disbelief and, and, and trusting in God. I would like to say to you that as these beautiful words are penned in, in scripture is, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Amen. And so you can cry out to God to help you in, in, in your unbelief. And just to, uh, in conclusion, I would want to just read this passage out from Desire of Ages, it says, not because we see or feel that God hears us, are we to believe. We are to trust in his promises. Mm -hmm. When we come to him in faith, every petition enters the heart of God. Just pause for a minute. It says every petition enters the heart of God. Mm -hmm. And it continues to say, we shall believe that we receive it and thank him that we have received it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We should believe that we receive it and that we already have it. Another time when someone was told, go your way, you are 
prayer has been answered is in the book of first Samuel chapter 17 chapter 1 verse 17 and 18 where Hannah had was really crying for a child and Eli answered and said go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him it is so interesting to know that this man didn't actually go home. He went on with his business. So let me ask, how many of us can ask God for something and go on with your life <laughs> as if there is nothing bothering you? You know, it's really a rhetoric question. Even to you, our brother or our sister who's listening to us, how many times do you ask God for something and you, are, you go your way? You know, you've prayed to God for the money for rent. Then you live your life as if it has already been granted. Verse 18, it says that, I'm still reading the book of 1 Samuel. Verse 18, it says, and she said, let your maid servant find favor in your sight. Mm -hmm. So the woman went away and mm -hmm. ate and her face was no longer what? Sad. She went on and to eat. How many of us can even like the taste of food even disappears from your mouth because you're going through troubles. Yeah. And if we check well, you've already prayed. So it has to be two ways. God's way, which means you have to go your way without worrying or you worry. And we know worry doesn't change anything. Yeah. We move to the miracle of at the pool of Bethesda. We've been we've done John chapter two, John chapter four, and now we are at John chapter five, verse one to nine, where there's a miracle happening at a pool of Bethesda. Brian, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the two encouragements from my brother and my sister. So uh the miracle at the pool of Bethesda gives me so many memories because uh, I remember <laughs> I think it was in the year 2014, there was a camp meeting here and mm. there was also a someone about this. Mm. And I remember vividly, I think it was Pastor Steve Stenoy, somebody. And uh, they, I still remember vividly him bringing out a different perspective from this and it was quite interesting. Because you see, this is a pool that, it was quite a large place and there were multitude of people. Mm. There are the paralyzed, there are the blind. Mm. The Bible writes there are also the lame. Mm. So you had to go there with somebody to assist you so that whenever the pool is stirred, you get to enter. Once you enter, you are healed and you mm. go your way. Mm. So we meet our interesting character in this. Mm. Somebody who had been a paralytic for 38 years. Yeah. I... I don't think anyone in this panel has reached 38 years. <laughs> and uh, I also believe that mm. if you've ever been a, a paralytic, as at 38 years, mm. you'd be one very frustrated mm. human being. Mm. Because I am sure he, where he lay, for those who are medics here, they know very well the kind of effects, even on your skin, even mm. on your conscience, even psychologically, mm. the effects of paralysis mm. on you, mm. how helpless you are, mm. even to do basic things that you're used to is quite difficult. Mm. So, it, like, in a multitude of people with all different kind of sicknesses, mm. Christ specifically spots this one person. Yeah. Like I was wondering, what are the odds? Mm. And then this is at the pool of Bethesda. Mm. And uh, as I allude to that sermon, actually the preacher said that it wasn't Bethesda, but it was B, the SDA. The <laughs> I know you've listened to mm. the sermon. Mm. And it was on Sabbath day. Mm. And actually from that sermon, Christ was being the SDA mm. by healing this person Amen. on Sabbath Amen. day. And it brought so many perspectives to me in that how often do we keep the Sabbath holy? Mm. What do we do on Sabbath mm. day? Do we pass somebody in need just to go to and keep the Sabbath? Just because we are keeping the Sabbath, you can ignore somebody mm. who is in dire need of mm. your, your help. Mm. Again, there was also the perspective of uh, the relationship between the our own sickness mm. in relation to sin. Because mm. we find that afterwards when Christ met 
this person because mm-hmm. he was overjoyed. He was told to stand up, you have been healed. Mm-hmm. And immediately mm-hmm. he received strength in his muscles, in his crippled limbs, mm-hmm. and he was able to walk. And uh, being uh, that he had been paralyzed for 38 years, this is somebody who could not keep silent. He definitely had to go and celebrate. And uh, the Jews who were there were mad at Christ, and actually they even wanted to persecute him because Christ had healed on a Sabbath day. But then again, we meet Christ telling him that if you at go, you've been made well, sin no more, lest a worse, a worse thing come upon you. And I was uh, trying to relate the issue of sickness and sin. And there are, there, are, there are stories in the Bible also of people who literally became sick as a result of sin. But also there are people who are sick, but their sin is not clarified. And some, we are not told if they sinned, like the story of Lazarus. But I was, I was trying to bring out this sign that in this world as we live right now, the effect of sin can affect us both physically but also spiritually. And in a situation whereby you think you've sinned and you're not facing the consequences physically, you could be a paralytic for 38 years spiritually. Is dead. Death, yeah. So you mm. could have died spiritually. Mm. You may not you may think that the wages of sin is physical death, mm. but actually you've died spiritually. Yeah. Mm. And this was also a very clear sign to me that in as much as you may think you're serving God, as Raphael was alluding to earlier, mm. maybe the spirit of God has left you yeah. as a result of sin. Yes, yes. So it is something that we should really take seriously Mm. in our lives. Mm. Let us remember that some of these things may not come as apparent as we may seem to think. Mm. Let us not assume that because the physical effects of sin may not have become apparent, Mm. that the effect of sin has been overlooked by Mm. God. We know God is merciful and God can forgive. But it is my encouragement that remember to critically analyze your life so that sin does not take a toll in your life. Mm. You may be coming to Sabbath, worshipping God and keeping the Sabbath Mm. day, but you're just like this 38-year-old paralytic. Mm. This guy who'd been a paralytic for 38 Mm. years. And it could be that your spiritual life Mm. is what is suffering. Mm. Even as I finish, I just want to also reminisce the words of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, Mm. which says that if my people who are called by my name mm. shall humble themselves and pray mm. and seek my face mm. and turn away from their sin. There is that aspect of seeking God, but and also turning, turning away, away from your sin. Yes. Because at that point where you turn away from your sin, mm. that is when God will forgive your sin mm. and heal yes. your land. Amen. So the aspect of healing only comes when you choose to turn away from your sins. Amen. May God bless us all. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Very powerful. Um, chapter 5, what interests me is when this sick man is asked, do you want to get better? Then he goes on. And you know, verse 6, it says, this, the last part, Jesus said to him, Jesus had spotted him, and he knew that he was already in that condition. So God already, Jesus already knows the condition you are in. And he asks him, do you want to be made well? Then he starts to say, you know what, sir, I have no man to put, put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, but... Uh, let me start over. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is what? Stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. You know, Jesus got tired and just asked him, rise up, take your bed and do what? And walk. <laughs> you have the healer here right now. You have the solution here. You're looking at him. And he's asking you a simple question. Do you want to be made whole? And this is the problem of being sick in a long time. This is the problem of going through failure in a long time. It becomes like a norm for you. Yani, you have given up. You, you just like, okay, nisawa vili takuja, itakuja. That's a very hopeless statement. <laughs> and I pray that as children of God, we stop 
making sad statements. Christ is asking you a very simple question. It is your time to get healed. Do you want to get healed? May we stop telling Jesus all these stories and just tell him, do we, Master, I am here. And like Marion tells us, help my unbelief if there is any sort of unbelief in me. And I pray that from today, we will walk up and take our beds and do what? Walk. And Christ is willing to give us that, willing, that healing. We've been talking about miracles, you know? The first sign, the wedding at Cana, the second sign in Galilee, and the miracle at the pool of Bethesda. We now move to our hearts. <laughs> Hard hearts. Ted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Before that, I'd like to echo a few things. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, on the, on the day of uh, the nobleman, that's mm -hmm. that uh, for his child, mm -hmm. uh, a pastor once said that we usually go to God with our burdens. Mm -hmm. Then we pick them up and we go back home with them. And that just shows how we mm. actually do not understand the concept of total surrender. Yeah. This man almost went back with his baggage. Mm. But by understanding, uh, the same same way how Christ told, uh, was it Bartholomew? Like, you believe by seeing, mm. but blessed are they who believe without seeing. So this is something to just encourage you know us here and, and all of us uh, listening, is that whenever we go to God, literally just surrender. It's difficult understanding i know mm. many of us might have anxious times mm. we really need it now but from somebody who's gone through also my own uh, experiences i've understood that just letting it go and allowing you f for you to see god manifesting in your life is an amazing journey to walk i hope you'll experience this as well Amen. now the concept of hard hearts now i like the fact that the lesson writer has literally picked us from a point of you know christ mm. Then it showed us his, his, his divinity and, and, and his relation to man. And I love how the book of Mark really went deep on Christ's divinity. Mm -hmm. Now, John here, as uh, my sister Marion has talked about, how he, uh, he really emphasizes the aspect of Christ relating with, with man. And, and, you know, I could be wrong. However, I see a sense of a Christ who understands our pain. Mm -hmm. When you look at him healing uh, the man who suffered 38 years, you can see that he understood the pain he was feeling. Mm. The entire anxiousness. That, you know, literally, as you said, 38 years, you're trying to be healed. How many times have you gone through physicians and physicians? And mm. You've lost hope. Mm. So, And God saw the hopelessness of this person. So mm. I love how we've been now moved from the perspective of being helped. Mm. You see, now we're from a perspective of now going to Christ as we need you, we are helpless, to now the perspective of us as Christians seeing somebody who is being helped. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you look at this uh, story, Mark chapter 5, verse uh, 10 to 16, it echoes on the Pharisees and literally the perspective of the Pharisees. And there's two key aspects that are found here. And the lesson writer starts by echoing, you know, not all signs come from God most definitely. But rejecting those that come from God can be dangerous because now you see uh, Christ really tried to you know, show himself to the Pharisees but you can see their, their sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. I like one of the things we read on the last Sabbath, uh, I think Mogera was taking us to, is the title, Who, Who Said You Can Do That? I don't know if you remember that, that part. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and the Pharisees come back and they ask this person, like, who, you know, at the same, it's just a question of who said you could do that? Why are you picking your mat mm. and walking mm. on the Sabbath day? And that's why, for me, I found two concepts of this uh, day on the hard hearts and Christ trying to show us the emphasis of the Sabbath and man. Mm. Most of the times we talk about the Sabbath and we think, you know, Sabbath is communion with just God, mm. but we forget that the commandments are sectioned in two aspects, love God and love mm. man as we mm. love ourself. Mm. And now you see the definition of a Sabbath, not necessarily the tradition, as my brother has talked about, he almost, I, I felt like he almost covered my day. <laughs> but uh, the concept of the Sabbath is not just necessarily just following routines mm. and, and just keeping a traditional way of things, you know, mm. in Mifika Friday. Mm. Like it, it's, it's understandable to wanting to honor God by, you know, keeping the Sabbath. Mm. But the aspect of just doing as you, it is to be done with your heart not understanding the value of what you're doing by not showing this kindness. And that's why Christ really shows and he does contrary to what the Pharisees 
think you should do. Mm-hmm. He shows kindness. He shows empathy. He shows compassion, love. This is this is the character of God. And and I'd like my brother, if you can read for us Colossians, uh, two verse eight, real quick. And if Ramona, you can open Psalms one thirty nine, okay. verse twenty three. Colossians two verse eight says that. See to it that no one takes you captive by, by philosophy or empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. According to Christ. King James talks about you don't follow the rudiments of the world that do not lead you to Christ. And this is something that, understandably, we are Christians. And, and I was telling one of uh, somebody we were coming with uh, a couple of days ago that uh, something I was reading, you know, when... Bible was, well, when the Christians were being persecuted and the Bible was being hidden from people, mm. people wanted to know more. Mm. And now it has been reversed to, there's no need for it to be so hated upon, but it's been so much allowed, showing that actually even there could be wolves among us. When we read about the story when Christ was in the synagogue, the first thing he also did was he healed a man who was possessed. My point is this. Mm. Even us Christians, we may be seeking Christ, but we may also find ourselves not seeking Christ, but entirely just keep in following this hollow routine and not actually finding Christ. Mm. That's why when I read that verse, it reminded me that may we remember that it's not just about we are doing what you're doing, you know, we have programs, but understanding that this is that we may continue to lift the name of God that he also other men may be drawn to him. Amen. And that's why, you see, even to, to us now, I want to relate to, to each one of us here. You know, as a Sabbath, it's just a manner of you coming, you know, a program, or even the people who plan, you know, uh, sacrifice their time. Do they even come seeking Christ? Do they even spend time communing with God, of communing even with their fellow, you know, uh, brothers and sisters? And as Ellen White talks about it, she says, uh, the Sabbath is a commemoration of the creation pointing us to God. Now, this points us, yes, to God in, 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 in admiration, in, in, in reverence. But there's also aspect of continuing to look up to God for his character and his nature. Because now it's not just aspect of revering God, but his character himself, who we say is he's long-suffering, he's merciful, he's good, you know, his goodness. And that's why Ellen White talks about even when we meet with one another. It is so important that we do not just give you my problems, hmm. but to, remember, to, to tell you the testimonies of what God has done to my life. And that's why I love the concept of hard hearts because we are actually shown the co- literally, I won't say the country, but it's enjoined together, the Sabbath and man. Because how many times of us, even Christians, you even know somebody or even you yourself, I would like to talk about myself. How many times have you appreciated and celebrated the success of somebody else? Mm. You see that the, the, the Pharisees did not care zero of this person who had gone through 38 years of, of suffering. Yeah, you'd expect to You'd celebrate. expect to be excited. Mm. They say, wow, you know, we praise God. Mm. Who, who is this? We thank mm. him, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, we think such, like literally this would happen to us and we're just like, oh my goodness, I'm so happy. Mm. You know, I'm happy for you. And you know, for me as well, something happened amazing this week before the weeks and something happened to my brother and I was so excited. I felt the joy, the happiness, mm. you know, I'm happy breakfast have come for you. And mm. when I was going through the list, I was like, God, what are you trying to tell me? Mm. You know, are you trying to make me to relate with this? And it showed me the contra- the contra- the, you know, the contradiction of how these people who we expect to know the law mm. are not happy when you succeed. Mm. And this is something for you and I to look into it. Are we thankful to God and are we celebrating somebody else's success when they go through, when God comes through for them? Or Only. are we focused on mm. our ne- or the selfishness that we have? Mm. May we... May me, let me just put it this way. Sometimes we pray with each other. Brian could tell me, Ramona, I'm jobless. Can you help me pray? Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm also jobless at the same time. So I am praying for Brian and I, and it feels so nice to be in the same situation sometimes. But at the point where Brian gets a job, job, will I be able to go to God with gratitude? You know? The same way I had the zone to pray. Oh, that is where I still pray. <laughs> and, and that is why you see mm. even the Pharisees, they mm. seemed to want to know who did this. More so, they may also take credit. Okay. These people were selfish, mm. prideful. They wanted to, and that's why they, they persecuted, in, in verse uh, 16, it says they persecuted Christ. Mm. Now, let me not go down there because I want to relate with our Please hard wind hearts. Up. Thank yes. you. <laughs> but I really, the aspect of our hard hearts really reminded me, and I just want you to read for us the Psalms 139 verse 23 and 24. 
uh, Psalms 139 verse 23 and 24. and 24 it says search me O God and know my heart try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting Amen. And that's what I want to leave with us, even as we go through and we welcome the Sabbath and we start this quarter, as we're looking onto the relation of us and Christ, may we have a heart that we also extend to our brothers and sisters, that we may not be found of what Christ said in verse 42. But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. So as we go through our days, our struggles, our pain, mm. seeing other people succeed more than what you have been praying for, mm. do not give hope. Wait patiently on the Lord, mm. for he always comes through. Amen. We're still building on this miracle at the pool of Bethesda. So on Songo, we are reading from uh, John chapter 5, verse 16 to 18, which I'll read. Um, it says, For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now. And I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal to God. Absolutely, this is blasphemy. Why was Jesus being persecuted for healing on Sabbath? I think, um, in all honesty, I, I think what Brother Ted has, uh, has, tell us, has told us, has explained to us, is, is part, partly the truth. I think amongst, the, amongst us as believers, it's possible that, uh, and sadly so, mm. that even those who are in positions of responsibility mm. or of duty may not really be converted mm. and may simply be there as simply another thing they can add in their CV, mm. a mark of uh, uh, an, another territory in which they have power that they can flex, that mm. I am an elder, mm. that I am a deacon, I can mm. make you do this, I can, mm. make, I, I can, make, th I can make things happen. Mm. You know, power for the sake of power. Mm. Not power that is bestowed as a sacred trust, such that when the owner of the, like, like the, the examples that even Christ uses are, uh, in another place is like, uh, the owner of a farm left workers. And then when he comes back, the workers, because he has gone away so far, the workers think that the farm is his. And I think he sends his son, and they, they actually kill his son, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, s something akin to this is happening in this, in this situation, that now Christ has come, and he has healed this man who is in need, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's not like he has caused a commotion. Mm -hmm. You know, if he wanted, he could have healed everybody at the pool of Bethesda. Exactly. And I don't know what the, I think the, they would have gone into a coma or something. Mm -hmm. uh, because <laughs> there were so many people there. But he chose only one case that was needy mm -hmm. and, and, and was very desperate. This mm -hmm. man had suffered for 38 years. Mm -hmm. And Christ, seeing something significant in this man, decides to do something for him mm -hmm. uh, on this particular Sabbath day. And then now they don't even really care. They, they, they're wondering, they're telling him, whoever healed you is a... He has broken the commandment. Why did he even tell you to carry your bed? You know, why, what, what are you doing? You're breaking. Instead of rejoicing with this guy who, who's, whose situation, whose circumstance has changed. Now Christ now introduces another, another factor. And he tells them that he's the son of God. Mm. And that now I don't know. Uh, it seems, yeah, he's just adding. Uh, uh, he's just. He's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's adding so, kerosene. <laughs> so some people say you can't fight with the truth. Mm. You know, uh, the truth will hurt you. You know, sometimes we don't really like when people tell us the truth, and and sometimes the truth cannot can can can't do anything but just be the truth, mm -hmm. and 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 to be truthful uh, in this world and in such a time in which Christ didn't even really care, just tell them, God is my Father. Yeah. And 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 also a lesson there before we continue is, is God our Father also? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then. To the Jewish mind, when you say that God is your father, it is akin to saying you are like God. Mm. That's a very powerful thought. Mm. In fact, somewhere else in scripture, it, it is referred, it's written, are we not called what? Gods. Are you mm. not referred to as gods? Because mm. God is our father. Mm. Because God is our father. That's an, that's an interesting thought uh, mm. that, that I picked. And so, um, these men and women, uh, rather in this particular case, more, more like men, because mm. of a highly patriarchal mm. society, were so engrossed in power and so rigid in their practices that they have inherited that they had lost sight of he who uh, these practices and all these uh, rights were supposed to point, point mm. out to. Mm. They, had, they, had, they had followed traditions and, 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 and ways of living to the extent that they, they had lost humanity. Mm. They had lost uh, their personality. Mm. 
And it is sad also sometimes that we can play church mm. by following uh, a script, Sabbath after Sabbath, mm. sunset to sunset, you know. We follow a script, mm. but yet um, when, 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 we met, when we meet with Christ from Monday, when you meet with Christ after Sabbath sunset, you meet with him and, he, and he's doing things, you know, uh, we, can't really, we can't really cope. We can't really cope. And so I think uh, let's not compete with God. Mm. And, and let's, also, let's also not compete as people of God. Mm. But let us look to complement one Amen. another, even as we work for the master. Amen. I think that's the important lesson for me. Amen. Mm. You know, when Christ defends himself, he tells them, you know what? My father is still doing what in this business? He's still mm. working. Yeah, it is Sabbath, but he's still sustaining the universe. You know, and this indicates the harmony in which Jesus does what works with God. And then the second way he goes ahead to call on to witnesses, John the Baptist, the miracles that he had done, you know. He calls on to the Father, the scriptures, and each of these witnesses give testimony in the favor of who? In the favor of Jesus. And finally, in verse 40 to verse 47, he says to them their own condemnation. He, he shows them, by the way, you know what? Me, I'm working towards the good of humanity. I'm not here to compete with you. I am not here to show myself best than you Pharisees. I am here as a savior. I am here as a redeemer. I am here as a healer. Why are you here? You know, are you here to point at me or ask questions? You know, who healed you? We want to know who healed you. Are you here to follow on my sin? You know what? You are a blas you, you blasphemed, you know, who what are you? What are your intentions? That's the question that I would ask us. We have come to an end, or rather we are coming to the tail end of this discussion. And as you have seen from just the tip of the iceberg, we are going to deal with a very wonderful lesson. I promise. I have read the book of John and it's one interesting, dramatic book. If you are the person who says that reading the Bible is boring, age, please just come sit, take your Bible, take your notebook, get your quarterly lesson and you will really, really enjoy at the feet I really enjoy being at the feet of Jesus, learning this truth. Like Marion told us, John says it as it is, you know, I am of my father. He doesn't go, go, like, go through bushes to say things. He says it as it is. So I don't know what are our takeaways from this lesson um, that we have done, the first one. Signs that point the way, starting from Brian. I... I just enjoy some of the signs that we've received from uh, these fellow panelists. Mm. And uh, <coughs> it's quite interesting that we're going to have uh, even more eye-opening reads exactly. in, this, in this quarter, mm. especially when dealing with issues, mm. when it comes to how we deal with the, the miracles that happen in other people's mm. lives. Mm. And... Uh, how it impacts us or our reactions towards them. Mm. So I I am expecting so many thought-provoking mm. uh, nuggets from this quarter. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Ted. Uh, to me, I really loved how on Thursday the lesson writer really warns us, may we be careful mm. that we not be the people who just believe in God mm. but do not surrender to Christ. Amen. For we know all power and dominion was mm. given to him. Mm when he went back to heaven. Mm. That's why we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. Mm. So I believe as we continue, I look forward to seeing the realisticness. Mm. I love how God is not just spiritual, but also is realistic with mm. us concerning, as you said, how we can relate and how we can grow to relate with one another. Amen. Amen. Um, my takeaway would be um, Jesus in speaking to uh, this people, he says, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Mm. In John um, 20, verse 29, Jesus, in speaking to uh, Thomas, he tells him, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen mm. and yet have believed. Amen. And so we can believe in, in God and he can be trusted. Amen. Amen. I think... Uh a text that Christ uses as he's uh, wrapping up his remarks to the Pharisees in John chapter 5. He says in verse 39, Search the scriptures, 
for in them ye think ye have eternal life, mm. and they are they which testify of me. Mm. In, also, in essence, Christ is saying it is possible to, f yes, to say that you are Bible-based Christians mm. and still be lost. Mm. Because anything devoid of Christ, mm -hmm. whether it is reform, whether it is Sabbath keeping, mm. if Christ is not in the picture, mm -hmm. then we are lost. Mm. That's a powerful thought. And uh, I, I hope uh, we think about it, that we could master and know the mark of the beast <laughs> and, know you, and even calculate the hour and the second of Christ's coming, if it is possible, and still miss out, mm. and still miss mm. out. We, what we need is Christ. Mm. Amen. My expectation for this is that we will actually meet Christ first. John really endeavors or labors to point us to Christ the one who loved him, the one whom he could spend time. Like, how does it feel to actually be told that I love you? And you actually see the actions, like the actions and the word go hand in hand. John is pointing us to this man that loved him and is also hoping that we will see him and understand the same way John is loved, we are also done what? We are loved. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome again for next week where we will be going to signs of divinity. Uh, Brian, please close for us with a word of prayer. Kindly let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our kind and loving master in heaven, we thank you for this discussion that we've had from the book of John. As, our, as your son Jesus Christ was dealing with the challenges of life in this world. Dear Lord, just like we asked you while we were beginning to lead and guide us through it all, we thank you for allowing us to come to this tail end and for successfully delivering your word to the people. Dear Lord, may this message bring a new and freshened hope in everyone who's watching this, and may it all bring out a fruit that will culminate into worshiping you in truth and in word. Guide and protect us throughout the rest of the service this day, for this is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.